I'm Jeff Russo, and uh, we are here today to talk about making music for movies and films and TV and video games and all kinds of stuff. Records, I don't know, commercials. Um, uh, I hope that you stay with us. Jeff, thank you so much for uh, inviting me here to your studio to talk again. It's so great to catch up again. Yeah, it's great to see you. <laughs> so you've been busy since last time we spoke. We, we did an interview few years ago um, but a lot has happened since then yeah things things have gotten pretty busy and yeah. you know continue to uh, to just continue to make music <laughs> you know, it's, it's a it gets to be it gets to be quite busy around here I'm sure uh, let's, let's rewind and start at the beginning a little bit I know uh, sure. we talked about your, your background and our past interview but I'd like to revisit it because it's such a cool story um, so I mean talk about how you got into into Particularly, I know you started off in music and doing bands and touring mm -hmm. and stuff like that, but when was the point where you kind of saw, you know, how you got into that world and where did you decide, okay, let's go to the studio and start uh, making, composing music? Well, I've always been a studio rat, you know, I've right. been trying to get in, in and out of studios since I was 14, you know, working in studios when I was a kid, yeah. cleaning up everybody's mess and getting coffee and taking out the garbage, um, and just trying to learn about, like, what it means to, to make music in a studio, um, you know, but after... The band, you know, we, we toured for a really, really long time. We still do shows. I'm yeah. doing a show in February, and you know, um, that's this month. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wow. Uh, sometimes I forget. Um, but so, you know, w we toured for a while, and then there came a point where we took a break, and I was sort of unsure what I wanted to do next. Um, you know, music has always been really important to me. Like, you know, the, the creation of music is really all I know. Mm -hmm. um, so... I had to think about like, okay, so am I going to make records? Am I going to try to produce records? Am I going to, um, I don't know. I didn't know. Yeah. Uh, so I, I hung out with my friend Wendy Melvoin, who's of the duo Wendy and Lisa yeah. from Prince's Band, and my, my wife and, and her, my wife and she, <coughs> they are, <coughs> excuse me, they're really close friends. So well, I was talking to them, and, and they said, why don't you come down and check out what we're doing in the studio? This was like 2005. Wow. Um, yeah, 2005, and and I did. I went down and watched what they were doing, and I was really sort of taken by writing music, being led around mm -hmm. by someone else's story, right. you know, and try and trying to help tell that story with music. You know, I, I was so used to writing songs, um, and the only thing that really mattered was what's the singer doing, what's mm -hmm. the lyric, what, how are we supporting what what we're trying to say lyrically, and how are we trying to, you know make this feel, you know, right. and it was and really just about three to six minute kind of, yeah, so, uh, six is long, it's more like two to three, <laughs> four minutes, and people yeah. were like, whoa, you guys are in prog rock territory now, um, but uh, so, uh, so I, I watched them do that thing for, for a little while, and I really, I really dug it, and then they asked me to, you know, they asked me if I wanted to hang around and work for them, so I assisted them for a while, you wow. know, and, and, um, hung around the studio and helped edit stuff and create sample stuff and recording musicians and stuff. And finally they asked me to write some, some cues for them. And, and that was, that was fun. Yeah. And I sort of, I had the hang of it early on, you know, right. the, even they were like, Oh, you kind of are natural at this. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it seems so natural to me to watch a story and, you know, feel how to make a certain scene feel a certain way you right know? because you can you know, nine different ways to do yeah, it or yeah. a thousand different ways to do it yeah. um and it seemed pretty natural to me so um because it came easy i started doing a lot more for them and then eventually i just sort of outgrew that um and went out on my own trying to trying to all of a sudden focus on making that a priority in my life and a priority in, in my career trajectory and what, mm -hmm. what I wanted to do and what kind of music I wanted to write. And, you know, the very first thing I did on my own was the show called The Unusuals, which was back in 2009. And that had a very sort of, you know, eclectic mix of rock meets pop, feeling music as mm -hmm. the score along with some also very procedural cop show because it was a mix of this it was sort of an ironic weird quirky take on the on the procedural cop show yeah. um so i got to bring all of my i got to bring all of all of my my things to bear you know i could yeah. play all these instruments and i could you know play guitar and make it sound like a punk band or make it sound like a ska band and it was all sort of very um very believable um 
and that that was great. That was a lot of fun. And then all of a sudden, you know, a few years later, the guy who made the Unusuals um, went to make Fargo. Yeah, no. <laughs> and so right, so it, and all of a sudden he was like, oh, you know, and yeah, we're gonna do this Fargo thing. And I was like, great. And I had no idea w w what the hell I was doing, yeah. you know. And um, I said, oh, we got to do it with an orchestra. It's you know, we're we're doing. We sort of have to pick up where the movie leaves off, right? In terms of how it feels, and right. that was an orchestral score, so why not do an orchestral score? And he was like, yeah, I was singing the same thing. And I had never written an orchestral note of music in my entire yeah, life at that, that point. Was that, like, intimidating? You know, it it was. Of course it was intimidating. Yeah. I, but but he, the, the funny thing is, is you, if you if you think you can't do it, then you can't. If yeah. you don't think about it, like, I never thought I couldn't do it. Right. It was intimidating. I was like, oh, okay, so how, what do I do? I mean, it's like, here's the melody. I yeah. like this melody. So what if I just put it on a violin? Okay, their violins are playing it now. And oh, it's orchestral. <laughs> Is it orchestral? So then I was like, oh, and violas and cellos and what about the woodwinds? And how do I, what's, you know, how do I write the brass? You know, so I started reading a book. I picked up a book on orchestrating because I'm, I'm not a, um, I'm not a, a an educator. I don't have a You're musical education. Trained. I'm not classically trained at right. all. But I find that that's not necessarily needed to be able to write yeah. music. I mean, there's a lot of things that I've learned over the last five years that have helped me write more and more orchestral music. Yeah, um, and let's hear that in your music as it evolves. Like, yeah. I, I, you know, I think that that's the. I think that's what happens, right? Yeah. You, you you listen to music and you read up on things and you, you sort of think about music in a different way, harmonically. I mean, certainly listen, think about it in a different way than I do pop music. But I still am always trying, or maybe not trying. That's the wrong. That's the wrong word. I don't have a choice. Like the, my pop music background and my rock music background yeah. filters into the way I write music. Like right. so, that ends up informing how I write orchestral music yeah, you know yeah. those chord changes and those the sort of harmonic structures so the more I learned about it and I like I took a I took a conducting workshop and now I'm conducting the orchestras that that are playing on my wow. scores and stuff it's fun um it's just you know the whole thing is a whole learning experience yeah, you know it's just growing as a storyteller I, and as a composer as a I, I would hope that everybody looks at their careers in that way you know right. I'd hope that that people who who want to make music, they, they don't come to the table with their tools yeah. and like, this is what I got. Yeah. You know, you, you want to, the whole thing is a learning process. The whole thing is a give and take. Music is a thing right. that you learn from, that you teach, that you, you know what I mean? It's, yeah, so it's a yeah. whole living, breathing thing. And and I think that that's what makes um, making music so thrilling and so yeah. fulfilling you know you, I get to learn something new I, I, every time I do something every time I talk to someone about music about something I'm writing or like oh what, is this good like is this writing is this working does this can you actually do this and yeah. does it you know and I'm a no rules type guy so I don't really think about like what you can and can't do according mm -hmm. to the book because right. I never had the book never read the book don't <laughs> really care about the book um, but there's certain ways to do certain things that you learn along the way you know certainly like with Star Trek I I um, you know I never really thought of how to uh, of how important brass the sound of brass is to the Star Trek scores until when we were recording and I would, you know, in in the later episodes, I started splitting up the recording so it was easier to manage on such a short time schedule. Mm -hmm. I would do strings and winds in the morning and brass in the afternoon. And the afternoon session, we always used to joke, oh yeah, okay, this is when, when the score becomes a Star Trek score. Like, right. here's the brass. <laughs> and like all these things are happening, which is really, was really important. And I had not written for brass a lot. And, you know, as, as I thought about what, what Star Trek, what the sound of Star Trek was, um, you know, I, I realized brass was a really important part of what that was going to be and, and how I was going to, how was I going to thread that in and make it my own. Yeah. Um, and that was a learning experience for me. And that's so a, that's, a, that's a, a big uh, property to have that learning experience. You know, it was, a, I, it was the learning curve was very steep and I had to learn it very fast yeah. and very like right at the beginning. Um, but I find that, those are the I think those are the best gigs. Yeah. The best gigs are where you have to learn something. You're forced to learn something in order to do it. Yeah. And I it, it makes it very refreshing. It makes it very new. And I was you know thrilled every time I stepped into the studio with the musicians and every time I sat down at the at the keyboard or at the you know um, workstation to write um, 
the music it was uh, it was a learning experience. So it, was, it made it really wonderful every time I had to sit down and yeah, do it, yeah, which was yeah. all the time, all day long, every day, all day for <laughs> months and months and months. <laughs> Um, just and kind of just a, and a big big idea. What does music mean? To you? I mean, you kind of talked about the importance of music to you and how it's been part of your life. But like personally, in a, in a rewarding kind of internal way, what does it mean to you? Like to, to tell stories through music. I mean, well, how is it important to you that, that you keep doing it every day? You know, it. I, no one has ever asked me that question before in in that way. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting to try to think about that. You know, yeah. I I enjoy telling stories and I was never a big lyric writer. Like in my band, mm. the the singer wrote the words and, you know, we sat and wrote melodies and, and, and chords and stuff and songs together or not. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what I, what, I, what I love to do is to feel what music can do emotionally. You know, music has such a power over a person's emotion. Yeah. Um, and it can pull you in or push you away or lift you up or drag you down or do anything to you really emotionally. Mm-hmm. And I think that that kind of storytelling is is just really, it makes me happy yeah. to do that. Like yeah. when I hear something I've written that makes me feel something emotionally or when I see that it affects somebody emotionally. It was one of the things that I loved about touring. It's like you, when you play your song and you hear people singing it or you see how it's affecting people, um, that's a thrilling thing in order to, um, you know, to have that kind of connection with someone. Yeah. Um, so I connect with stories and I connect with the idea of other people connecting with these stories. Right. And that, that's, that is a really important part of, of music to me. You know, also, I have music in my head pretty much all the time. So sometimes I don't care and I'm just walking down the street and yeah. I'm just whistling it. Or sometimes I'm like, oh, this one keeps sort of going around. So maybe I should jot that down or, or you know, record it do, somewhere. Do you have like a bank of like random melodies that have popped up that no. you saved for like a rainy day or something? Or? I don't sort of, I don't look at it like that because uh, music doesn't work like that for me. Okay. You know, I music is sort of everywhere and the, mm. the question is like how do you carve out everything right. around it to find the thing that you want right, right. and I mean that's how I go about it I don't like wake up in the middle of the night with a oh I've got it and I write it down and the next day it's a cue I, that, yeah. that doesn't happen for me yeah, yeah. you know I will occasionally be walking around my house my kids will be running around and I'll sit down at the piano and just sort of something will just sort of come out then I might take my phone and record it so I don't forget a certain melody. But it's not like, it's not like that idea strikes and I must grab it mm-hmm. because music is all around. And especially with writing for, for any kind of media, yeah. you know, that's all about how I'm reacting to it. Right. You know, so one of the things that's really important for me when I sit down to write either for a TV show or for a film or, or a video game or whatever it is, I have to have a connection with it and I have to be moved in any direction. Yeah. So when I watch and I'm, I'm moved by it, something happens and I find something somewhere. You know, it's, it's not really about, I, I've, I've sat and had to be um, moved by something where something is not really, I'm not really clicking on something. Yeah. So I, I've, I've had to sit there and try and find something. And what, what you find is like, that's not always your best work. But if you're not inspired by what you're working on, yeah, or if it's not even in, inspiration, because inspiration is such that's a that's a really big important yeah. word to people, and that's not really what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is when you watch something and you're moved to do something, you know, like okay, I kind of get it, like this is what it needs. Right. You don't always get that from what you're watching, so sometimes you just have to do something, um, and that that's a part of the job of it. You know, mm-hmm. you have to continually conjure up some sort of thing um and not everything is a hundred percent inspiration it's right. not always like the birds are singing and the <laughs> the sky opens up and there's the theme you know that happens but when but you it, watch something are you reacting as an audience like you're reacting if you're sitting in an audience or do you put yourself in the position of a character well to get in that state of mind or something i think it's i think i i, I sort of use all of the all of the above you uh, know where the very first thing i want to do is watch yeah and how is it making me feel as an, as an audience right. member as someone who's just figuring out what the story is now then the idea is okay so 
is what I'm feeling what the filmmaker wants me to feel? And if it isn't, they want the filmmaker to feel this. Well, how can I help move that over there? Right. So, you know, there's, of course, there's the, the best case scenario is everything is great. And music is just going to be something that is going to make it even better. Yeah. You know, as opposed to, we didn't quite get this, but can we help it a little with music? And then, like, you're sort of using music to manipulate. And that, that's, a you know, a, a completely reasonable and justified use of music. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's when, you know, it's not the most inspirational. It's not the most, like, now you're trying to bring your tools to bear to sort of fix what's going on or move things around. You know, a lot of times that mostly happens when something needs pace yeah. and they haven't really got it in the shot but right. we need to feel more pace okay put in some drums and we'll make it yeah. we'll make sort of some short strings and we'll make it we'll make it um we'll make it fun or we'll yeah. make it like yeah, feel you know momentum. feel the momentum of yeah. it going that way like they're chasing that guy but they're not really moving <laughs> you know um so i i would say like there's there there are moments of that inspiration but it's not really always about inspiration right you know yeah. The inspiration should normally come when you're inspired by the story. So it's not always sitting and watching a, a thing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's reading the script. And a lot of times I read the script and then I'm inspired to write themes. And then you sort of look to see how that might work to picture. Do you ever get it wrong where you read the script and then you, you see the final picture and go, oh, I wasn't envisioning it that way? Or... I, have, I have written music for... A sh for a, a piece yeah. um, based on a script and then the piece of music put to picture wasn't what I was expecting it to be because uh -huh. what ended up on film wasn't what was scripted. Right. Um, that's not to say it didn't work right. because it worked great and then I just had to sort of tailor it to the, yeah, to, yeah. The, to the thing. And it was meant for the storytelling device but the storytelling device changed a little bit, so it wasn't what I ended up. It wasn't what I originally intended or what I originally expected. But in the end, that sometimes ends up being better. You know, it, it's it's um, it's a collaboration. You know, filmmaking is a is a is a collaboration. You know, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna put that on Do Not Disturb. <laughs> Them changing things as we go, right? Um, means I'm changing things as we go, right? And I I think that's what makes. That's what makes the whole greater than the sum of its parts. You Can you know? say what project that was that you wrote um, for the script or, and they just put it on there and it worked? I, I can. I can. That was a... So a piece a piece I had written for Fargo uh -huh. um, called uh, Orchestra for Nikki. So the, there was a character, her name was Nikki, and I don't know if you watched Fargo oh, yeah, 3. So in her. Fargo season 3, Mary Elizabeth Winstead played Nikki. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a piece of music for her character, a you know, theme for her character. And then one of the ways I did it, I orchestrated the whole thing and we we used her theme for her, but we used a portion of this orchestra version of it as the end of an at the end of an episode. Wow, okay. Um and it wasn't what I intended for this one piece of music. It was written for another scene, and it had ended up at the end. And when I when I saw it and how it worked, I was like, "Oh, you're a genius." I said this to Noah. You're, yeah. you, you know, th the fact that you you took what we thought we were doing over here and put it over here. It was it was a very it was a very um, it was a very interesting way to do that. And I was. Well, I think you know, it goes. I think music and image go both ways because I think. You as a composer have to look at an image to be inspired to write music. Sure. But as me, as a, I'm not a musician, I'm a you know, visual storyteller. When I'm conjuring up an idea, I usually go to music for that inspiration. So, and you look at one of my favorite directors, Leone, and you know, Mark Honey wrote those scores before anything was shot. They were right. on the set and everything. So, I mean, I right. think it. Which is how we did Fargo season one. So, Fargo season one, I wrote, I, I wrote a good forty percent of the score just to that first script. Yeah. Just for and he took. He took all that music with him to shoot and to wow. scout, and so the music informed the the story informed the music, and the music informed the story, and like you know, and that's that's a lot of how Noah and I work together. Um, yeah. Is you know he has these, this incredible gift of, of storytelling, and as he shares that with me, I start writing music that I'm inspired to write based on these stories, and then he uses that to 
inspire the way the storytelling continues. And it's it's a really interesting um, way we, we work together. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that's fun. You know, and it's it's definitely more like you would think a movie would be made. Yeah, you know, and that's... Definitely. Or the way that we hope movies get made. Like nowadays, movies get made on such a quick turnaround. We were talking about how fast Lauren is in, yeah, in, in writing. And it's right. like, you know, six weeks to write an entire score for a movie. It's not a lot of time. Yeah. We yeah. do that in television a lot, mm -hmm. um, but you know, films are a much different sort of animal, and like you yeah. know, and there, there's a lot more, or you'd hope that there's a lot more room for for things to be moved around, yeah. but there's not a lot of time, you right. know. So, I mean, yeah, in t television, you're doing more story time because it's in terms of an hour to like, in terms of like running time, but you're doing in like chapter mode, whereas the film is two and a half, two, two hours, and just yeah, two, hours block, two yeah. hours and two and a half hours of music. Yeah. And you know, in that way, I try to treat the stories for television that are cinematic in right. the same way. Like, you know, with Fargo, it is one story over 10 episodes. Yeah, yeah. The same with the night of, it was a, it was very much Many that. Series, yeah. And it, it, to a certain degree, I treated, um, I treated Star Trek the same way, which was, we were telling a whole story across all 15 episodes. Yeah. As you get into 15 episodes, it gets a little more difficult because there were individual episodes of Star Trek that had a different, that were different. The, like episode eight, which was the Povins, and we were on this planet, which, didn't really have any relation to the rest of the season's storyline, yeah. um, other than it was the crew of the Enterprise or uh, the crew of the Discovery, and yeah. and you know they were doing their thing. So we did have these sort of standalone episodes, but right. generally speaking, there was a an arc of storytelling, and thematically, I could do that. Right. Um, not so much on episodic television. Yeah. And episodic television doesn't really work in the same way. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about uh, TV for a bit because sure. that's a big bulk of your career. And currently, I mean, just to name a few shows that you, you work on, Lucifer, Bull, Waco, which is the current miniseries on Paramount Network, uh, Power, Legion, Ghosted, Altered Carbon, uh, Channel Zero, you're, Star Trek Discovery, you're, uh, Counterpart, you're and Fargo. Me. You're scaring me. <laughs> Those are all current ones that are so running I, right now. I'll say this. The, the, the misnomer uh, about, you know, you, you listing this... It, it, arguably unimaginable list of, <laughs> of things. Yeah. And w what happens is like a number of things can all come out at the same time, they but the same they weren't time. worked yeah. on at the same time. Yeah. And, or, or there's a lot of overlap and like with Altered Carbon, I mean, I've been working on Altered Carbon since, since September of 2016. Wow. So that's when they hired me. Um, and then it was, you know, we finished sometime in the late summer mm -hmm. of, of last year, but they weren't finished mixing. We were like sort of, you know, uh, zipping things together. And then there was Counterpart, which sort of went over across that. Fargo happened early in the year, and I try to do a lot of that writing early. So, you know, I split my time up between things. For because, sure. you know, many times I get that question, like, how can you possibly write that much music all at once? And the answer to that question is it's not possible to write yeah, all of that of music all at yeah. once. <laughs> so you you you, you want to make sure people understand like it's not, it, it's, it's right. It's it's it couldn't be you know yeah. so like there's this block of time for this and then there's some you know like you can write three or four things at the same time but you can't write nine yeah you know it's just no one can do that right and and then of course yeah physically not possible but I'm also curious mentally how is it possible because I think you you're these are. What I love about your work is that there's so each project is so different. Like I feel like you have not typecast yourself into or pigeonholed yourself into any type of like the Jeff Russo. I've like, always I've always hoped to do that. Yeah. Like I've always so hoped was, like was that the idea like to well, choose projects that are kind of very different. I'd say the for a long time when you're starting out. Mm -hmm. You don't have that. No, yeah, we would just take whatever. You, comes right, yeah. like you get a job, like you're yes. like, oh, I gotta take that. You know, yeah. I gotta do that. <laughs> um, I think I'm still suffering from that. I still suffer from that. Like. You, I've talked about this with with other friends of mine who are are in the independent contractor world, yeah. like we all are. You right. know, like so you you get afraid to say you can't yes. because of of other commitments. So you end up, you know, maybe taking on too much at one time, mm -hmm. and then you never sleep or you never see your family. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then there's the then there's this this idea of wanting to always take jobs that you are 
connected to, yeah, you know, yeah. and you don't always get to make those choices. Um, so I never, I, I don't, I didn't really think, I didn't really think of it in terms of, oh, this is a nice departure from this, and this is different enough from this. Yeah. I don't really think about it like that. I, I love to write music, and if I'm inspired by an idea, I will be interested in doing that, mm -hmm. you know. Um, if I'm not inspired by an idea, then the question is, do I need to take the job? Like, yeah. do I want, you know what I mean? Do Is the job required in order to continue to live yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know yeah, it's your right pay the bills, exactly so. so i would say I, I haven't really thought about things like that the, mm -hmm. the the good part about it is when you work on a few projects at once if you get stuck on something you can sort of shake it loose by jumping onto something else right you know so i as as i was as i was doing um working on star trek um, and then also working on Legion at the same time. Like, because mm -hmm. I'm now in full working on Legion mode. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the Star Trek season, I was like writing some Star Trek stuff, and I was like, I can't really get this one thing. So I would jump onto Legion, which is a, you know, it, it's a 180 degree turn oh, yeah. from, from that kind of music. So that sort of helped, you know, to jump back and forth between those right. two things. Um, you know, to, to think about stuff for Ghosted, you know, Ghosted, which is like an, I mean, it, it's like an 80s, you know, it's like Fletch meets yeah. Ghostbusters, you know, it's right, a little yeah. bit more of a throwback for and sure. it's comedy. So when you do comedy, it's a different idea of how to score. Like that was something I had to get used to with dealing with comedic elements. Like, because right. I'm, I, I don't ever like to be on the nose. Yeah, um, I think the music... You can't be on the nose, right, for comedy? Well, like, sometimes, you, sometimes, I mean, it depends on the, the type of, depends sure. on the project, right. right? So when you're doing single camera, half hour comedy, oh, yeah, yeah, you're yeah. right. Like, you want to score it like it's a drama. But yeah. when you're doing multi-cam, being on the nose, being jokey is, right. I think, okay. For sure. That's not something I've ever done. Yeah. Um, but... Trying to be funny or trying to underscore funny is a lot different than trying to underscore um, something that's emotional. Yeah. So I think with that show, though, I've tried to find a way to underscore the emotional content and still have it be light enough to be funny. Right, right. And that was a, that. That's a that's an interesting one to to sort of manage. Yeah, because that's kind of. A... Have you, have you done much comedy before Ghosted? Uh, I would say no. Yeah. I mean, I, I did... So I, I did um, this show for USA called Necessary Roughness, which was an hour-long dramedy. Mm -hmm. You know, so like there was dramatic elements and there were also sort of light, funny elements. And so what I learned in that show, which was a lot of fun to do, yeah. was that the thing I don't like to do is to play two sides in any scene. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I try to apply is never play funny and drama at the, in the same scene. Right. If the scene requires a co comedic cue, only play the funny side. Right. If, if it requires a dramatic cue, but then gets funny, don't play the funny. Stop playing music. Get out. Right. Because <laughs> you know? I mean, you gotta let. Because sometimes the actors can take that bearing on themselves. They can do the comedy. Yeah, and the, or, drama. And the drama. You can if there's they can underlay the comedy of that and let the, the the dialogue maybe carry the drama. Yeah, so or the that. or vice versa. Let the yeah. let the funny be funny. Exactly. You don't need to make it funny with a slide whistle. You know. <laughs> I've, um, I've had to ask that question. <laughs> Would you like a glockenspiel there? Um, and sometimes the answer is yes. <laughs> and then you put a glockenspiel there. <laughs> Ding! Well, I mean, if you're Wes Anderson, you can work for a completely different context. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Um, for some, I mean, like, let's talk about like a miniseries and something like uh, Waco or The Night Of, or even anthology series like Fargo and Channel Zero. Um, they have these self-contained season storylines. So something like Star Trek, which will continue... Does it affect your approach when you know that that final episode is the final episode? I, I mean, that's that's the kind of storytelling I love. Yeah. So, I, I I love telling a story. Right. And I love that story to have a beginning, middle, and an end. Yeah. Um, and one of the reasons why I'm always so gravitating towards that kind of storytelling, like The Night of and Waco and 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 Channel Zero, which is a really interesting 
thing altogether yeah, because yeah. it's just it, they keep coming <laughs> you know <laughs> they keep calling me saying okay we're doing the next three i'm like whoa wait what happened i've been done with the last six and what's going on um and the the fun part about that is i don't have to think about what i'd done before right you, you know um i was talking with steve zalian who who is the the guy who directed all eight episodes of of the night of Amazing and wrote all the uh, yeah, yeah i mean it's steve zalian's yeah genius um we were talking about what the next one might be. And I was like, oh my God, I didn't think that there would be a next one. You right. know, like, yeah. what's the next one? Yeah. Well, I don't even know. what You tell me, what's the next <laughs> one? You know, um, because it was a very specific kind of storytelling. And I imagine the storytelling devices will be similar, but we'd have to, con- you know, come yeah. up with a whole new a whole new thing. Just like I do with Fargo. You know, um, right. Fargo is, I've had three very different scores all three seasons yeah. you know and very different although the feel of the show is the same sure. it, it needed to be completely new themes and new everything um and that's the thing that i enjoy most about that like with something like waco well waco's not coming back because exactly. that's that's a thing that's, told yeah. the story and it's over right. it's like the old school movies of the week or the old school miniseries like yeah. roots or whatever like they told a story it was based on a book or whatever, and then you were done. Yeah, yeah. There wasn't this, oh, and we'll do another 10, or we'll do another six, um, which is the thing that always blows my mind about Channel Zero. Like, they they have these little stories that are inspired by these um, by these internet uh, uh, the, ideas, the creepy pasta, yeah. you know, <laughs> which I had never heard of before. Uh, yeah, <laughs> before the I think that's yeah. almost where Slender Man came from. Oh, uh, yeah, that, the, that's interesting. Now it's a feature. Now it's a feature, yeah, there you go. Um, but I mean that kind of the whole anthology series because I remember when American Horror Story came out that's kind of the first big one that did it and then of course Fargo and and um, I mean now you have the popularity of Black Mirror which is each episode is a self-contained story and that um, this so popular do you think our viewing habits as people are changing are we are are we more tuned to consume in kind of smaller batches instead of a series that runs for eight years or nine years? You know, I think the tastes change. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that if you look at things, if you look at things as a whole, you know, there's a, there's a group of people who really like one kind of storytelling. There's a group of people who really like other kinds of storytelling. I mean, you can sort of look to see who's watching this and who's watching that. And I think tastes change. I think, you know, um, Law and Order was like the most successful television in the, ever, Sorry. right? Yeah. Um, and that's a very specific type of storytelling, and that worked for a really, really long time. It, you know, that type of storytelling, it still works, not not to the same degree that it did in the right. early and mid '90s. Yeah. Um, but I think that people still make those shows. They still make these these weekly procedural sure. shows where there's a different sense. story. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think that people have just really become attracted to um, a sort of higher level storytelling. Right. You know, people people want big storytelling devices. You yeah, know, I mean, yeah. Game of Thrones is oh, the perfect okay. example of that, right? It's this, it's such a grand story. It's such a, you know, yeah. it has so much breadth, breadth. You know, it's so yeah. enormous. And people, I think, really like that really high um, high concept storytelling yeah. um, way of doing things. And I think that that's the style that's sort of people are, are digging right now. I know. Now. I mean, TV is, I mean, there's so much television. <laughs> and it's and it's, it's true. I mean, you see, I think a lot of the great auteur storytellers and filmmakers and they're all working in television now. And it's you know, it's, like, a, it's, it's definitely, it has... It has afforded a really, 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 um, it's a, a renaissance of, of storytelling, yeah. you know. And, and you're right. So a lot of people who were making films are now making 10 episode miniseries, miniseries or yeah. television. Yeah, yeah, whatever it is. Like Altered Carbon is the perfect example of that. Like it could have been a movie. Right. You know, it could have been one two and a half hour long odyssey of a movie. Yeah. But we were able to do it in 10 episodes. And um, I think that the the way it was done was the right way you know yeah. and it's it's an interesting it's an interesting way to look at it yeah mm. um given your schedule and your workload do you have time to watch or do you have to <laughs> it's funny to like see what other people are doing i i don't watch as much tv as i probably should mm-hmm. um to check out like i now will watch tv just to tune out yeah like to tune all the music out and to tune all of everything <laughs> like i just want to 
just enjoy, yeah. you know? So a lot of television nowadays takes a lot of brain power. Sure, you know, people so are a yeah. lot of investment. You have to invest a, you know, and that's the thing about weekly procedurals yeah. that I think people are attracted to. There's not a lot of mental investment. You can watch it one, be totally entertained, yeah. and then not come back to it for like, yeah. you know, eight weeks. Jump around the season. Right. Yeah, yeah. And it won't, and it really doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, Whereas if you're watching Game of Thrones, you had to have watched from the beginning of season one, yeah. you know, which at this point is seven seasons of television, you know what I mean? Hour, yeah, and I ran minutes. into that with Mad Men and I remember, oh, yeah. so I remember my wife saying, we have to watch Mad Men. And I was very reluctant because I was like, oh my God, how are we going to watch Mad Men? It's already in season five and, or season four, I think at the time. She's like, I'm just going to get the DVDs and we're just going to watch it. And I was like... <laughs> Okay, so then we did. And I'm thankful that that happened because we watched from the very beginning and finally caught up and then watched the last season live. I did the same thing you know, with Breaking Bad. Okay, yeah. so I know a lot of people who did that with Breaking Bad. We yeah. didn't do that with Breaking Bad. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that that was but that's the kind of investment you need to invest, you know, like you yeah. need to give to these really intensely um Intensely made shows that that have so much to offer, but you have to also give back. <laughs> yeah, I know. It yeah. really requires participation on the audience's part. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, you don't also, you know, it's not just television, but you do a uh, dabble one in film and video games, other things too. And you just have a, a movie premiere at Sundance called Lizzie. Yeah. Um, starring Kristen Stewart. Um, does scoring a film have any uh, different creative rewards versus like reward? Is it cre- rewarding in any different way than television? So. The answer to that question, I think, for m- most, for a lot of people, might be yes. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, the answer is, it's it's vaguely the same. the The reward yeah. th- that I'm talk- uh, that you're talking about. I, I think that the um, the reward of sitting and watching the film in its final form in the theater and like in all of its glory yes. was the same that I felt when I saw Fargo at, at, you know, we went to, and we premiered it at, at, I think it was at the arc light. There was the premiere right. and I saw it in all its glory and thought, Oh, this would be great if it was a movie. Cause it would be on this big screen. And I think that's the, maybe the one thing that's different, but mm-hmm. you know, so many people watch television on these big screens with these loud sound systems so you're really sort of getting you're getting the whole you're getting the whole picture um getting the whole point of it um so and i approach film i I approach the you know most of the television i do i approach it in the same way that i approach a film thematically speaking and i and i try to tell a whole story as opposed to continually writing new little cues for every little thing for all 22 episodes which is a different style of music making for for television um and it's different than what i enjoy doing or different what i that different than what i normally do i i do work on shows that i that that is required Mm -hmm. um and those are fulfilling in a different way yeah um they they have a different like i the the that's fulfilling in the way of i'm trying to figure out how to do things differently every time is it more mechanical i would say it's a little more mechanical and like putting puzzle pieces together and like oh I have to figure out how to do that one thing that I, I usually do when that character does that, but mm-hmm. in a completely different way because he's doing the same thing right. in a different, you know, they're in a courtroom. Yeah. How many times can I do the courtroom <laughs> scene, you know, and right. and have it not sound like the 20 other times that I've done it? So that's there's a fulfillment there that is it fulfills the sort of right brain part of me, mm-hmm. left brain part, whatever's the logic part. Um, I don't know. Um, you know, so there is a, a, a little bit of a fulfillment there, but it's yeah. not it's not the same sort of general musical fulfillment that you feel when you when you're when you're trying to tell these sort of grand stories and you have right. this big, you know, more more of a big um, global idea of yeah. music for a certain t- uh, storytelling. So in that way. It's very different. Schedules are totally different, too. It's like I had seven weeks to work on the music for Lizzie where, you know, I have six days to write an episode of Star Trek. And there's way more music in an episode of Star Trek than there was Mm -hmm. in in the movie Lizzie. Lizzie. (laughs) Yeah. So what's the turnaround from, like, start writing to finish recording an episode of Star Trek? um, We would... Let's see. I'd spot... From spot to 
recording for from spot to actually recording the episode with the orchestra i think was 10 days wow um and that's 10 whole days like yeah. including a weekend so, so you wrote the entire episode in that, within that frame. so we were tracking some and doing some editing of some cues because mm -hmm. recording that much music every week um is it's it's not possible. It's, you can't record that much music in in a three hour session. Yeah, yeah. So um, so we were we were recording usually 20, 20 to twenty five minutes of music and tracking like five to eight minutes of music. Tracking meaning like we're taking cues that have been done and mm -hmm. editing and moving stuff around and and reuse and yeah. reusing some stuff. Like right. a lot of the thematic material we could reuse. Like this string part from here will work. Yeah. You know, so that that kind of thing. But it's 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 about 20, 20, anywhere between 20 and 26 minutes of original music every episode. Um, and it's a lot. It's a lot. Right. So, <laughs> but, but it's not just writing music and then it's writing and then it's orchestrating and then it's recording and then it's editing and then it's mixing. So from, from the, from the spot to the dub, which is when I have to deliver a final, a final mix to them right. is a, is, um, just over two weeks. Still, it's a very short time. Yeah, two yeah. weeks, and and everything is leapfrogging. So I have two weeks from that first Monday, right? But then I have another two weeks from the following Monday. So the next episode, right? So it kept going like this. You know, right. it keeps it keeps leapfrogging oh, each other. <laughs> so the, it's I'm in a constant state of having to write delivering it to Amy, my orchestrator, so she can get it all on paper, yeah. then going and recording while I'm still writing. And that, you know, it was, okay. so it was that, it was like that for, um, uh, 11 straight weeks before the first of the year. Wow. And then four weeks after that, you know, four weeks when we got back <laughs> to finish. Well, Maybe I mean, it was 12 straight weeks. It was 12 straight weeks and three. Yeah. 12 and three. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It was pretty nuts. Um, we're kind of rewinding to when you first, uh, I mean, the great part of a lot of the shows you do, I mean, sometimes composers change on the series throughout its run, but you've got to, you know, start on a lot of these series and kind of season one, episode one, do that first score. Um, do you normally, is it, is there kind of like a warming up period before a series kind of gets going before you figure out, okay, we got the right sound. Is there any tweaks being made between episodes two, three, sure. four? Sure. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, so with Star Trek the question was really finding the balance and like mm -hmm. finding the, the tone and the sound of the show, which I think that we did in, in episode one. Mm -hmm. um, thing, you, I'd like to think that I do enough prep work for, for a show of that size and, and nature so that we really know what we're doing once we get in. And I wrote that first score, sent it to Alex, who's the, the, the showrunner, or he was the exec, one of the executive producers in yeah. charge of music. And, you know, he had some notes, but he was like, you have found the right sound for the show. Um, there wasn't a big like, Mwah, this isn't, no, don't do that. Yeah. We got to do it over here. Yeah, yeah. That didn't happen. Now, that has happened, you know, like you, you sort of, Sometimes you, you write something and you're like, that happened with Altered Carbon. So Altered Carbon, we had this idea before they shot the first episode. And I wrote some themes and the themes themselves stuck, but the sound of the show um, made a change. When I, once they were done with the, the mm -hmm. pilot episode, um, they were like, you know, we really feel like this needs to be a little more like this and this needs to be a little more like that. So I sort of approached the score differently once it had been shot. Right. Um, so there was like a, a period of time where it was like, okay, so I have this, but now I really need to sort of morph it into this other thing that right, they want. Right. Um, so yes, there is a, and I think that that happens with any show altogether. You feel like it when you watch those first few se the episodes, even not just the first music, whole season, yeah, like is usually like, oh, you, season. <laughs> they really don't get it until the, like the last three episodes. You're like, oh, they got it. Yeah. And then season two, you're like, oh, we all know what we're doing. I know. It's, you know yeah. All your favorite shows, if you watch your first season, it's like a completely different thing. I remember <laughs> thinking that about House. I used to be a, a big, huge fan of the show House. Yeah. I didn't get into House until season two three mm -hmm. um so once i got into it i went back and watched season one i was like this isn't the show that i'm watching <laughs> yeah. um so it's interesting to see how shows like For evolve sure. yeah, you know yeah. absolutely we were talking about kind of uh, i mean television is such a, a fast-paced schedule 
Um, do temp scores ever come in? Is, is that a thing in television? I know yeah. it's a big thing in movies. Yeah, I mean, I mean, are they, is there time for temp scores? So, we, when I work with Noah, mm -hmm. there is no temp score. Right. Either he's temping with music that I have written for the show, mm -hmm. or he calls me and says, we don't have something for this. I need something. Send me something. Yeah, yeah. So, and that's rare. That's like a, that's a rare thing. Yeah. We didn't do temp score for, for Fargo. Right. We didn't. The only time anything is ever tempted is if he's using a song or if he's using something that he wants to use from somewhere else that's not going to be our original score. Yeah. Um, Legion is the same way. Really no temp score. Really, we're just temping with music that I write for the show. Either it's music that has already been written, and then we just need something new here, but this is the this is what we want, right. you know. So I'm, I'm really only competing with myself. Mm -hmm. um, but on most other shows, um, there there have been temp scores and yeah. that can either be really helpful or it can be really, really hurtful. Uh, like, just like in a movie too. Yeah. yeah. It can be used as a tool to guide you or a tool to constrict you. It, and it, yeah. it really all, it's a, it's a matter of, of the, uh, of the filmmaker. You know, if the filmmaker, you know, filmmakers can be very, become very attached to a temp score. And some filmmakers are like, yeah, it was temp score, like write the score. Mm -hmm. You know, the temp is just so we could see what music would be, you right. know. Um, but some filmmakers craft a temp score, that's the score that they want. Yeah. And I'm like, well, you crafted the temp score with Star Wars. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? How do I, you can't do that, exactly. what can I do? Yeah. Um, I'm obviously exaggerating, yeah. but that's the point, like, you know, how many times, and I'm sure you can ask any composer this question that you've ever talked to, mm -hmm. but the amount of times that Inception has oh, been God, has yeah. been tempted, it's just like, and I always say, I sit in a spotting session and I look at the editor, I'm like, you cannot temp with that cue from Inception. You just can't because <laughs> none of us can compete with that. Like, yeah. that's a thing. So you're, what are you asking for? Yeah, I don't even right. understand. Right, you know. It's kind of funny, actually. But, it, but it, also, when you edit to a certain piece of music, and I always equate it to, like, when you put your hand in snow and you take your hand out, only a hand can fit back in that print. It's not, you only your hand only can your fit hand. Exactly. Not someone so, else's bigger hand or some smaller hand. Right. Like, it won't be the same. Yeah. So I think it's the same with the score. When you take it out, that structure of that scene, now, even if you mute that track, it's still mapped to that structure of music. So good editor, really good editors, mm -hmm. don't get caught up in that. Okay. Editors, I find that, you know, and by the way, I have to hand it to editors on a television schedule. Oh I don't, I mean, it's, it, yeah, you know, it's next to impossible. Yeah. So they use a temp score to help them, right? Yeah, they you need something. Right. Yeah. So, well, I mean, if you, if you talk to, to the um, Breaking Bad people, what oh. they will say is there was never a temp score. Like yeah. he would never put music in and he would, they would do the whole thing and then they would get the composer to come yeah. in the end and be like, here's, write the score, <laughs> you know? And that that can be at the same time very frightening and really really thrilling, you know, yeah. like oh hey, yeah, blank slate, you know. Yeah. Um, so it's very difficult. There's no blame to go on anyone, sure, like, sure. but it can be very frustrating for a composer because it's just like, well, you've tied my hands, yeah, you know. So because a composer should never be asking like, well, can you change picture here so I can, <laughs> you know, it's like that's I'm not the editor, that's your job, you right. know. Um, so. Now, again, I've had that conversation with Noah because we have those conversations. I'm like, you know, a we can, relationship, well, yeah. we, it, it's an, it's a unique relationship yeah. where I've said, or even to Regis, who's his main editor mm -hmm. and, and, um, he, who's great um, editor of music as well, where we're like, maybe we should add eight frames of picture here so we can have that thing happen yeah. you know, with music. And we've done that. Um, I've never been so bold to ask for that, but we've talked about like how picture and music can actually live sure. and breathe together. Absolutely. Um, and I think that happens more in music, in movies than it does in television. Yeah. Fr and frankly, it's probably only because there's the time. Because, you know, you have an editor who's been working on a, on a single movie, a single 90 minute or two hour long piece yeah. of music, or two hour long piece for six months, yeah. <laughs> you know. So he's living, breathing with that for a long right. time. And there's not a deadline for the next episode coming. Right. <laughs> um, so kind of, uh, I would like to ask composers, and it's going to, of course, vary on different projects, but um, where does the first note come from for you? I know you talked about you hum songs, that melodies would somewhat pop in your head, but when you're sitting in front of something, do you gravitate towards something specific to kind of start getting that first note out of your head? Do you like to 
read the script, watch the film? Do you just noodle on the piano? I mean... I think it's all of the above. Yeah. I, I think that there's no one way for me no, to do no, it. There's no... There's no I don't have a formula for that, like, yeah. to figure out how to become inspired by yeah. something. Like, you know, it either comes or it doesn't. And when it doesn't, then I just force something out until something feels natural. Um, you know, there's make a coffee, there's go on a run, yeah. or there's... Co- and, you know, that's at those moments where you have no idea. Do you and get writer's block? I mean, does it happen? It, I don't... Writer's block is a thing that people talk about that I'm not sure I understand. Yeah, like, I, I don't understand either. Because I've I never been to a point where I'm just like... like well, but I've been stumped. Yeah. Like, hmm. Right. Try to write something and it's not working. And I'm like, okay... I don't know that I consider that blog. I've never, I don't know that I've ever sat around thinking like, oh my God, I have nothing. Yeah. Um, because it's not f- for me to have. That's the thing about music is like music is there. Music is right here. Mm-hmm. There is music right there. Not right now. Um, <laughs> because it's off. It's off. <laughs> um, but like, so there are ways to find um, there are ways to find music and just to, you know, you just got to get out your hammer and chisel and chisel away at all the stuff around it. Oh, and yeah, eventually yeah. you'll find that note. Oh, yeah. Um, sometimes it's like you, you do that. And you're like, Oh, that's great. Oh fuck. That sounds just like that thing I did three days ago, <laughs> you know? And yeah. we're all human, oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> you know? So I don't know that there's one specific way I like to try to get that first note. You know, sometimes that first note is hard to come by. Yeah. And sometimes you find that first note and then the rest of it comes pouring out and mm-hmm. sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. You know. Sometimes it trickles out, sometimes it right. pours out. <laughs> I've always thought about that. Like, I've, I never met Alan Silvestri. Uh-huh. But I always thought, like, God damn, that theme from Back to the Future, it's just always there in the back yeah. of my mind. And I always think, like, how did he come up with that? I know. You know, because it's, it's so unique. Right. And, um... Anyway, I don't know. I, I just went off on a tangent. No, but, like, I, I wonder that same thing about people who sit down and, like, how did you write that one iconic yeah. thing that you did that one time in 1983, you know, or whenever you wrote right. that? But you I think know. at the time, like, I think the only thing, it only things only become iconic, I think, when the public makes it. Iconic. Well, like, yes, yeah. but there, you know, sometimes you sit down and you think of, you, you know, it's not the iconic aspect that I'm talking right. about but, but you sit down and you write something and you're like range. oh that's that's pretty special yes, like I that, that. Yeah. I feel that you feel it in a way I felt that way with the Fargo theme oh like God, yeah. when and I it, it's not an egotistical thing it's yeah. like to me it just felt good right. so I imagine like and you know I, I, I don't know Alan Silvestri I don't know John Williams I don't know these people who wrote or, or Hans Zimmer who, yeah. you know when he wrote that uh, that inception thing you know right. it's like he had to have known like as he played that chord change like oh yeah yeah that's it you know i, I always wonder about how how people how that comes about with people no, you know sure. because you, you, that stuff comes about for people sometimes few and far between or sometimes a lot you know obviously mr williams writes those things in his sleep or i don't know how he does it he eats he eats melodies yeah. for breakfast um <laughs> But uh, just imagine with a bowl of melodies. Yeah, just a bowl, just a bowl of notes. Yeah. Oh, yes, of course. That's kind of funny. Um, I mean that with the utmost respect for oh, Brandon. Yeah. Um, but but you know, so it's an interesting question. Like, how, how does that how does that come? I mean, yeah. I don't I don't know that anybody knows. Like the guys who sit around and write hit songs. You know, like I don't know how that you know. <laughs> you sit down and like you strum a chord and sing a note and like there it is. Yeah. It all just comes out. Wow. It's interesting. Yeah. Or it's yeah. the same happens with with you know movies and yeah. anything. <laughs> yeah. Um, so at this point in your career, I'm just curious. I mean, you, we were talking about how you're growing and evolving and learning and everything. Do you sit down and do you have like? a five-year plan do you say oh i'm here right now and this is where i want to be in five years hmm. or do you just kind of take it one project one day at a time i mean is that like a do you have like a, a goal you're trying to reach like personal goals or anything no no it, you know it's funny i i was interviewing somebody for a position here yeah that's like an interview question and, right and I, I asked that question i said do you what do you, where do you see what, like what do you want to do in five years yeah. five-year plan and she answered the same way i would she would she said I don't believe in five-year plans. And I was like, you know, I get it. Yeah. yeah. I understand that. But that that wasn't truly the meaning. that I, It wasn't my meaning. Like, I, yeah. I wasn't like, what's your 
hmm, I have six things I want to be done in five years. Yes, that, yes. that isn't really what I meant. So, so I think that I don't really think about that far in advance. Right. I think the idea is to continue to grow. Yeah. So but you don't know what that growth is. I, yet. No, I yeah. don't, and I never know what tomorrow will bring. Right. You know, so um, I think that's part of the thrill of yeah. doing the job that we sure. do, and part of not part of the thrill of it and the dread of it is not knowing what's going to be happening in, in next year or two yeah. years or five years from now. I'd love to continue to be writing music, you know, for for many different kinds of things, many new things. You know, I, I, I did some work on video games last year, which, which was, was the first time that I'd ever done yeah. that. And I, I, I thought that was really fun and really great. I'd love to continue to do that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm starting to do more films, which I, I find fun and exciting, yeah. you know. So I, I think that I'd love to see my children flourish that's a five part of my five-year yeah, plan like to see them grow up and 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 do do fun stuff um you know i i think that that's the extent of a five-year plan i'd yeah. like to be living yeah, in five that's years that's uh, i'd like to be healthy you know <laughs> so i i feel like that i think that's the thing to to constantly think about you know not not to think about how your career is going to be in five years but to take that in a in a step-by-step -step basis Absolutely. you know always yeah. wanting to grow and always want to do better than you did before right yeah you can't really ever tell what's going to happen true. five years absolutely from now. <laughs> you did mention and I, I was going to ask you about um your video game work because you did an amazing score for uh, what remains of edith finch and even the story mode for madden Right, Madden NFL. Madden, yes, the story <laughs> mode for Madden NFL, um, 18. which was that was I'll tell you what that was a lot of fun. I mean, both of those were were a lot of fun to do. You know, the Madden thing was really great because, you know, they really wanted this mix of some emotional orchestral stuff, but really it was about it was about a teenager, a kid growing up into football, yeah, and that to me felt like. A little more grounded mm -hmm. so I used a lot of guitars and a lot of acoustic guitars and drums and like that kind of thing and and I, I made it really sort of Americana sounding which is that, that that's sort of where I came from like you know yeah. our, our Americana yeah. rock music um, so that was a lot of fun to do yeah. um, I hadn't done something like that on that big a scale before because it was a pretty it, we treated it like it's I mean it's an hour and a half long movie so yeah. um, it, it was uh, it was fun to do but but Edith Finch was a long a project that took a really long time like we worked on that for almost two years that's, yeah that's how I mean, games are can be like that yeah like... so there was a lot of there's a lot of growing pains not not for the music but for the sh for the for the um, for the game itself like yeah. it went from Sony to Annapurna and there was this whole time where we stopped everything. We didn't know what was going on. Um, but the music for that ended up being truly one of my favorite things to work on. I, and it's a lot. It was a lot different for me. Yeah. Um, in the in the style of music that I wrote, right. and that was a lot of fun. It was just a lot of fun to do that. A lot. A lot of you know. You get a lot of leeway in video games that you don't get in film or television because. You know, a lot of it you're writing before they're doing anything. Yeah, so you they, they usually take your music and kind of. For their they do a lot of animation yeah. to the music. So as I was writing these really sort of lush, slow pieces, mm -hmm. I saw the I saw the game sort of develop in that way, Around which it, yeah. yeah, it was really, really, really incredible. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a beautiful score. It's a, yeah. it's a beautiful game. Like yeah. that was the thing that really attracted me to it. Like the idea of what the game was about. And the storyboards that they showed me and the, all the art that they showed me, I was like, it was inspiring just to look at all that stuff. Yeah. So I was like, I have to do this movie. <laughs> I have to do this This game. It's really beautiful. Absolutely. Um, and, I, and to kind of wrap things up, I, I, you know, what's something that you know now, one of those you know, generic questions, but what do you know now that you wish you could tell yourself right when you're starting to write music? When you're working with Wendy and Lisa and getting into this thing, is there something that you know now that you wish your younger self would have known? Hmm. That's a tough. That's a tough question yeah, because lesson that you, you know. Well, you, first of all, never, ever, 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 ever say no. That can't be done. Ever, no matter what, under any circumstance, <laughs> never say that can't be done. And because the moment you say no, it can't be done. 
the beginning that 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 leads to the next thought in the other person's mind, which mm. is someone can do it. Yeah. Someone else. Who can that be? Right. You know what I mean? So I, I think like if somebody asks you, well, I'd like to do this, like the, the idea is you say yes and figure it out later. I'm not saying say yes to every job because yeah. that's, you know, yes, you want to work as much as you can. Right. Um, but I mean, like, when you're when you're thinking about how to go about doing something, if somebody says, well, what about this? Like, you know, unless you don't believe it's the right thing to do, like, never say it can't be done because of budget. Never say it can't be done because, like, always, always say, you know, always be a yes man. Mm -hmm. You want to be the guy who can do, or the girl, mm -hmm. you want to be the, the person who can do whatever you need to do. Yeah. Um, I think that was one of the things that um, helped me. Um, and that was one of the things that I learned early on, yeah. you know, like you always want to be the person who, who can, who can just say, yeah, 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 we can do that. Of course we can do that. Yeah. What are you talking yeah. about? Well, it's easy. Really. <laughs> take, yeah, take care of it. No problem. Um, you know, and then you figure out, figure okay. out how to do it. Like, yeah. And then you go home and panic. You know, it's like, that's, that's what we do. That's what composers do. <laughs> composers go home and panic. Um, you know, one of the things it's, it's funny. It's like. There are a few stages of getting to the point where you start on a project. And yeah. one of those is, you know, there's the self-hatred part. Like, there's the, when are they going to find out that I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And, like, they're going to find somebody else to do it. And then there's the, I'm nothing. I can't do this job. I'll, I have nothing. And then you sit down and you start to do it. And it's, you know, yeah. usually it's all fine. Um, I think that knowing that you're always going to go through that is something I, I would go back and tell my my five year five years or eight years ago person itself you know but at the same time it's like part of part of the job part of doing it uh, what i'm doing now is, is just sort of an aggregate of all the things i've learned yeah. in the last eight years so you know people are always like well if you could go back and tell your 12 year old self something like and i was like i wouldn't want to tell my 12 year old self something yeah. because i want them to have the innocence and i want them to have to learn it in the same way i did right you know I was standing on the on the um, on the podium about to conduct my theme for the new Star Trek, mm -hmm. and I w I was terrified. Yeah. I was terrified, all those things. But there was also that like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm doing the thing that you know. I, I mean, I watched I watched Star Trek when I was a kid, yeah. right? And then I thought if I could go back and tell my my 12 year old or 15 year old self that I'd be doing that first, obviously my 15 year old self would be like, "Who the fuck are you? And why do I care?" Um, but but the the 15 year old self would freak out. But I wouldn't want to freak out the 15 year old self. I want that person to go through all that stuff and, grow through that, and yeah. get to the point where you can be 48 and <laughs> and um, and freak out about yeah. that kind of stuff. So it's an interesting conundrum of a question when you right. ask like would you go back and tell yeah. it's like i don't know maybe i would yeah. you know there's certain things that you learn along the way that you need to learn along the way For sure. so i don't know that's sort of a cryptic way of saying yeah. i don't know that's <laughs> <answer. Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Jeff, thank you so much for sitting down again. It's been another yeah, thank, amazing chat. Thank you. Thank so. you very much, man. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. <laughs> cool.